Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth session of the conference, The Hidden Hero. How can a net zero food system be delivered to the benefit of people and planet? This session is entitled, How Can Citizens Help to Deliver Net Zero Food System? We have four speakers for you today. Christina Bauer-Plank from Unilever, Lujane Alkanmani from the EAT Foundation, Michael Bacher from Google, and Richard Swanell from RAP. Each will discuss what they see as priorities for citizens to deliver net zero. To provide a little context, um, both the RAP and UNEP research suggests that fast progress toward healthy diets in line with national and international guidance and food loss and waste reduction would help deliver a net zero. Um, each speaker will provide their contribution and then we will have a Q&A session for the remainder of the session. Please note that the session will be recorded and added to RAP's website after the event. Um, and before we get started, I just wanna note that um, when you look at UNEP's recent report about, for instance, food loss and waste, what you find is that households are representative of about 11% of all global production in terms of what gets wasted. 11% um, of all the food on the planet is getting wasted in households, but citizens are actually influencing much more than that. Not only are they influencing um, what happens directly in their households, but they bring so much influence to the businesses that they support, whether you're talking about the grocery stores or restaurants or uh, what happens in the cafeterias in the campuses of, of businesses where they work. Um, they All those businesses are really trying to meet the expectation of customers, um, which are citizens. So I think there's a ripple effect that's really important to consider as well as we think about this. Um, now for today's panel, first I'd like to introduce Christina. Christina leads Hellman's, one of Unilever's biggest food brands found in millions of homes across the world. Um, and she has served in multiple roles across Unilever's food businesses. And now she's bringing her expertise to both the science and communications of sustainability for purposeful brands. Christina is a member of the Champions 12.3 Consumer Behavior Change Task Force as well. So Christina, tell us um, why Unilever is involved here and what Unilever sees as the key priorities for action to help citizens deliver a net zero future and, and what, what's currently being planned around the world by Unilever. Thanks for the question, Dana. I'm very happy to be here with you today and, uh, and the whole panel. Our vision at Unilever is to make sustainable living commonplace. A key priority in that sustainability strategy is to be net zero across our value chain by 2039 and reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero within our own operations already by 2030. Our climate action plan sets out the steps that the company will take. And just to mention a couple of examples of we, what we're doing in that space, we have already moved to 100% renewable grid electricity globally last year. We have committed to a deforestation free supply chain by 2023, and we will have food waste from factory to shelf uh, in our operations by 2025. And uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to speak about that at the Champions 12.3 event. But what I will address today is how we are integrating climate action into the work our brands are doing with citizens, with a key focus on the two areas we consider most important. Firstly, supporting people to transition towards plant forward diets, and secondly, helping them to use food more responsibly and reduce their food waste. We have made it part of our future food strategy to support consumers uh, to more plant-based products and guiding them towards healthy and sustainable eating patterns. That is why we committed to reaching 1 billion euros in annual sales for plant-based meat and dairy alternatives by latest 27. Innovations such as plant-based burgers or sausages from the vegetarian butcher brand, vegan mayonnaise from Hellman's, or non-dairy ice creams from global brands like Magnum, Cornetto, or Ben & Jerry's directly contribute to lowering the carbon intensity of much liked and consumed food products. But next to that, our brands are encouraging people to eat more and more diverse vegetables. This effort is being led by NOR, 
underpinned by its Global Future Foods report, which Noah published together with the World Wildlife Fund UK in 2019, to, promo to promote more diverse plant-based eating patterns and biodiversity. This approach is reflected also in Noah's innovation pipeline and recipe inspiration campaigns. For example, you know, a simple thing like spaghetti bolognese prepared with lentils instead of minced meat, which is arguably quite a small change of consumer behavior, can reduce the greenhouse gas footprint of that particular dish by 83%. But let me now zoom in, in the second focus area, the reduction of household food waste, which is very close to my heart. Unilever is one of the biggest food manufacturers wants to ensure we, that we protect and pro preserve food to feed the world. And with one third of all food produced globally being lost and wasted, food waste contributes 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. We've heard it a couple of times today and literally feeds climate change. And with over 60% of food waste ha happening in consumers' homes, helping citizens to use their food more responsibly will have to be a major part of the solutions. Big global brands like Hellman's that live in the kitchens of hundreds of millions of households have an opportunity, and I would argue responsibility to help people reduce how much food they waste. But no consumer ever sets out to throw good food in the bin. People have all the right intentions to cook great tasting, wholesome meals for, you know, from the food they buy, but then life gets in the way and food waste happens as an unintended outcome. So people need help to develop better shopping, better storage, and better usage habits so that wasting so much food will be a thing of the past. Hellman's is on a mission to inspire and enable 100 million consumers every year to be more resourceful with their food at home so that they waste less. And we do this through our awareness and inspiration campaigns like our Make Taste Not Waste campaign that currently runs in North America and Europe where we inspire people to turn their leftover ingredients into tasty meals we have also developed evidence-based behavior change programs in partnership with, with world-leading experts that help families reduce their household food waste by up to one third. So in summary, helping people transition towards more plant-based diets and using their food more responsibly with less waste will require a collective effort from brands, companies, NGOs, and governments to achieve lasting behavior change. But there is no real alternative and actually reward is huge and plentiful. A much needed and sizable contribution towards a net zero food system, healthier diets, more biodiversity, more preference for helpful brands, and even money saved in people's household budgets. So uh, this is where I want to leave it for now. Thank you and back to Dana. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, I can say that we, ha we have been really excited to see the Make Taste Not Waste campaign um, hit the US, it hit with a bang, certainly uh, during the last Super Bowl. And it's been really neat to see how much energy there is around it. Uh, and, and it's a really fun campaign. And I think that's been key is, is making things fun for, for people and for consumers. Um, and I would love to try one of those vegan um, magnum bars for sure <laughs> one of these days. I'm sure, I know we've been hearing a lot about how we need to engage that younger generation. And I think things like, you know, vegan magnum bars are just the way to do it. So <laughs> great to hear about those as well. Um, thank you so much, Christina. Um, we'll now turn to Dr. Lujane Alkanmani, and she is the director of the Global Action at EAT and a member of EAT's senior leadership. She is responsible for implementation of EAT's strategic goals. She oversees EAT's projects and measures the overall organizational impact. Lujane has a background in global health and medicine. So Lujane, tell us what, um, what does the EAT Foundation think, <clears throat> excuse me, are the priorities for helping citizens change to help deliver a net zero future? And what are you doing to try to achieve these ends? Um, thanks a lot, Dina. That is an, quite an excellent question. Mm -hmm. But uh, first, allow me to speak briefly about the strong evidence about the um, power of food to equip citizens to help achieve net zero. Um, he, together with the Lancet, uh, had published a report back in 2019 
that set for the first time the scientific targets of sustainable food systems and to answer simply one question, which is, is it possible to feed 9 billion people a healthy diet without destroying the planet by 2050? And the answer is yes, through a triple approach, a shift towards a planetary health diet, adoption of regenerative um, food production practices, and having food loss and waste by 2030. And these results were also iterated with the IPCC special reports on climate change and land that stated we need a better land use, less meat intensive diets, and no food waste to save our planet. So we simply have no chance on delivering on all the sustainable development goals, nor the Paris agreement, if we don't transform our food systems into healthy, sustainable, equitable, and resilient ones. Now, citizens are key actors to deliver that change through the amount and the type of food that is on their plate that will not just reduce the environment impact, but also save and improve lives. But to truly motivate, empower, and inspire citizens, businesses and governments have an important role to play in creating a healthy, right food environment and ensuring that healthy and sustainable diets is actually affordable, desirable, and accessible, as the responsibility for health and sustainable food system is evenly shared between stakeholders. For example, governments can and should create and implement healthy and sustainable food-based dietary guidelines, enhance marketing regulations and transparency, and integrate true cost accounting into national or regional policy and budgeting, standardize marketing, labeling, and implement the right physical policies, having subsidies on the right stuff, the healthy and sustainable food, and the taxes on the wrong things, are the unhealthy and sustainable ones. While, and businesses also have an important role to play to equip citizens to achieve the net zero, by engaging with and informing consumers, creating the right and new marketing tools and the right incentives that is centered around the value of people and planet. Be transparent about true prices of products and be responsible and transparent about providing the front of package labeling schemes and promoting the healthy choices. Now, um, as there is no one size that fits all, interventions must and should take into account the local food systems, cultural connotations and literacy levels. This is not only will inspire and motivate and empower people to take actions and enjoy the right food options for them, but will also help to create a movement, a global movement of people that is better informed and can demand strong actions for a better future. And for your second part of your question, Dean, about what EAT is doing, EAT currently EAT together with WHO, UNICEF, um, WFP, UNEP, GAME, and WWF are working on a broad coalition for healthy diets from sustainable food systems for children and all that emerged from the UN Food Systems Summit that addresses all forms of malnutrition, food safety, and environment sustainability through three entry points food supply chains, food environments, and consumers to align efforts at all levels across sectors for collective impact. We have simply one goal, which is double the number of people eating healthy and sustainable diets by increasing the diversity of the right type of food, increase consumption of what is sustainably produced and safe, and limit consumption of all the wrong stuff, which is uh, food and drinks, high in unhealthy fats, sugar and salt, including highly processed food and curb access consumption of cheap mass produced red meat among high consuming groups. In addition, we're working closely together with cities, for example, together with the C40 network, we were able to get 14 cities to commit sustainable food policies through signing the Good Food Cities Declaration, which is based on the Eat Lancet Commission. 14 cities, that is around 500 million meals K 
healthcare year offered in schools, hospitals, and other public places to improve availability and affordability of health and sustainable diets for their citizens. I will stop there, Dina, and happy to answer any more questions afterwards. All right. I seem to be having a little trouble with my video. Oh, here we go. Oh my goodness, there was so much there, Lou Jane. Thank you so much. I think, you know, you bring out so many great points about incentives and what a key role they play in changing people's behavior, um, about just the holistic approach we need to take. We can't have people talking about nutrition over here and greenhouse gases over here that just, doesn't, that's not how we eat, right? As people, as citizens, we eat as, you know, we approach food in a holistic way. It delivers so many different things to us. And I think we need to really um, approach our systemic, you know, design with that holistic lens. So really appreciate that. And it's great to see so many cities taking a leadership role um, as well. So thank you so much, Lou Jane. Um, Let's now move to Michael. Um, Michael Bacher is the VP of Global Programs for Real Estate and Workplace Services. And he leads Google's renowned workplace programs, services such as food, transportation, um, guest services, and place making, even fitness and massages for people at work. Um, and he's focused on providing integrated offerings and experiences that enable Googlers to thrive around the world. Um, he's also focused on supporting the growth and future of Google through scaling these programs. And I will say that I have watched Michael, I mean, before that he's really led their food program and taking it from something that um, was world-class in delivering food to people, uh, to, to the people working on Google campuses to, to being even more than that and really looking at how can, in providing food for their own employees, Google really be a leader on food system issues overall. Um, so Michael, uh, so much to cover, but tell us, you know, what do you see as the key priorities for helping citizens deliver net zero? And specifically, what is Google planning and has done in your own operations um, that encourages change? Thanks for the question and the opportunity, Dana. It is good to see all of you. Maybe a little bit for context. False pandemic, and I hope we're gonna be there shortly. Um, our organization will provide truly delicious and tasty, healthy food experiences to our workforce around the world. We will be operating about 55 plus countries around the world. So we are an operator. And I think with that, we get an opportunity to help our user base to really make healthy and sustainable food choices. And I think for the context of our conversation today, let me just highlight a few areas in which we're making a difference and where we're enabling our users to ultimately make those food choices that will get us closer to a net zero food system. So starting on the supply or the production side, we are hard at work in electrifying all our kitchens around the world. That is not necessarily a small feat. It's gonna take a little while. And when we have those kitchens, it is about buying and using carbon-free energy 24 seven, 365 days a year. That is in itself truly, truly challenging because in many of the countries in which we operate as of today, true carbon-free energy is not available yet. And this is more than just buying offsets. So thinking about how can we create a production environment where we can produce with the least amount of carbon impact. The second area is to think about our offerings. So we have been on a journey with our user base to get to a more balanced plant forward diet. And I would say years ago, we had this false belief that if you tell people that eating more vegetables is better for you, they will just follow you all the way along. Didn't really work out that way. So we started to think through, are there alternative ways? And it's really about flavor, taste, and making alternatives really, really convenient. So we worked with a great food services partners around the world, Compass, ISS, Sodexo, the various partners we get to work with around the world. And we asked them, can you offer more balanced plant forward menu offerings? 
And what we learned is that this is a systems challenge. Not all culinarians are equipped as of today to really make what we're looking for just as tasty, just as flavorful as our more traditional elements. So we started to work with them. We started to think about alternative dishes, blended burgers. Instead of just having 100% beef burgers, might you blend them with delicious mushrooms? Can you actually flip dishes? Instead of making proteins, especially red meat, the center of the plate, could you make it the garnish? So we did all kinds of interesting stuff to really to start to affect what we would offer on a daily basis. The third area that we're very focused on is actually thinking through when we produce it, how can we make sure that the most of what we produce is actually being consumed? And then we'll break it out into what we're doing in our kitchens and what we're doing with our ultimately our users, our consumers. So on the kitchen side, we've been working now for a great number of years, one with our great uh, food services partners, as well as with a company called Lean Path to really track what we're throwing out and to create a global database of all these food waste moments and to look for patterns and to use data to identify where are opportunities and support our culinarian workforce with data to ultimately reduce the food loss in our production environment. And on the consumer side, there are so many little things that truly make a difference. So we change the size of our plate. If you have smaller plates, people ultimately get less on their plate. And if they would like to go for seconds, they can only do that. Another interesting one would be is the elimination of trays in our cafes. And I think what we have learned over the years is that little things can make a big difference. And by just doing it, you're just making it the default setting for our users. The fourth area is we've been working actually very closely now for a great number of years with a variety of amazing partners all over the world. The Culinary Institute of America has been our partners to really help our culinary workforce to scale up. An organization like Refat has been very helpful for us to get more insights into where can you ultimately make a difference. The World Resources Institute with the Better Buying Lab has been very instrumental for us in thinking through the description of dish titles. What you call a dish truly makes a difference. And we've learned that what type of dish titles will ultimately entice people to go for the better dishes. And then last but not least, I'm very excited to work with another team in our organization, the Food for Good team. That is a team that is working on how might you use data to bring together a variety of organizations, big retail that has a food surplus in their stores together with those organizations, for example, Feeding America or others that are ultimately looking at food to help those who are in need of food. And as you can imagine in our organization, we do believe that data and technology can make a difference. And we're looking at how might we bring those partners together in order to ultimately use data and technology to make sure that less food goes to waste and that those who are food insecure have a better opportunity to find their next meal. And when I bring it all together, Dana, is I use our ecosystem as a working lab and ultimately making it more convenient for our users to eat better to inspire more that ultimately you can get more done by just when you start to get going with something and ultimately share our learnings with the broader world as well. And that's really how I believe you can make a difference. That's super. Thank you so much, Michael. And I will say I have had the pleasure of eating at Google a number of times. I have not missed any meat when doing so. They do such a beautiful job of making things delicious and making those plant forward healthy items delicious in reasonable portions. You just, you don't miss it. Um, and I think there's a lot to learn from all of the, the choice architecture that they've done um, <clears throat> as well. So Michael, thank you. And, and it's been really wonderful to watch Google just take um, what some others might consider serving food to your employees and really grow it into a leadership on what the food system needs moving forward.
So thank you so much, Michael, for um, your contributions. Look forward to discussing more. Um, and now I will introduce Richard. Richard leads RAP's international work, uh, working with partners in over 40 countries to deliver systemic change, particularly within the global food system. RAP's programs, such as the Quartald Commitment, inspire and deliver change. For example, helping reduce food waste across the UK supply chain by 27%, or 1.7 metric tons per year, million metric tons per year. Um, so Richard, uh, you have been working on this for so long. Um, it's been wonderful to watch all that RAP has done. Tell me, what do you see as the priorities now for, for citizen behavior change and what RAP is doing moving forward, having done so much already? Thanks, Dana, and thank you very much for that introduction. And yeah, I've been working at it so long, I've gone gray. You can see that on the top. So that, that's one of the <laughs> drivers here. Um, but really good to be part of such an excellent panel. And, and I think there are three core priorities to help citizens make their contribution to help towards helping deliver a net zero future. And these have come out by all the speakers, but I'll just go over them again, because I think it's really important to emphasize these key areas. They are reducing and hopefully eliminating avoidable food waste, getting our portion sizes right so we get the right amount of calories to keep us healthy and helping us all eat a healthy, balanced diet. Taking those in turn, one of the interesting things about food waste in the home is that recent research from UNEP in their Food Waste Index report has shown that there is over half a billion tons of food thrown away in households across the world every single year. This is an absolutely huge amount and nearly double the previous estimate. The other key finding was that the amount of food waste in the homes in households around the world was broadly similar in high income countries and middle income countries. So household food waste is a global problem. And that will be important for most countries of the world to address if we're genuinely going to deliver a net zero food system going forward. So how do we tackle food loss and waste? Well, the critical thing is that most people don't think they waste food in their homes. And in fact, when RAP started its work in the UK, around nine out of 10 people said they don't waste food. And yet 70% of all post-farm food waste in the UK occurs in the home. The second point is that people don't want to waste food once they know that there is an opportunity to reduce food waste. And so by understanding the behaviors in the home, such as planning, storing, storage, storing food in the right place to maximize shelf life or using up leftovers, we can design interventions that help people change. The other key feature is to segment the target audience so that we understand which part of the population wastes the most food and therefore gives us the most opportunity to change. For example, in the UK, many over 50s are often low food wasters, largely because they have the skills and often the time to make the best use of food. Whereas younger people between 18 and 30 have fewer skills and have more hectic lifestyles, are more often, which tends to lead to greater food waste, although they are very keen to learn. So using this information, we can target messages to the populations through our Love Food, Hate Waste Behavioral Change campaign, supported by material on the campaign website and help people reduce food waste, save money and reduce green uh, carbon emissions. This approach works through the Love Food Hate Waste campaign and indeed through actions by retailers and manufacturers to help citizens change through getting rid of, for example, buy one, get one free offers on perishable goods in the UK and providing resealable packs for short shelf life products this has really helped citizens change and reduce food waste. So in the UK, edible food waste is reduced by 31% or 1.4 million tons per year less food waste in the home alone, worth around 6 billion US dollars. So the scale of this food waste reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is equivalent to taking more than 2 million cars off the road. And we're increasingly setting new social norms, again in our society, associated with minimizing food waste. Things that human societies had for, for decades, almost millennia, we're now relearning those again. And interestingly, this approach has been used in other countries such as ne Netherlands to great effect, in Denmark, and in Love Food Hate Waste campaigns in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Central Europe. The second area to driving change is getting the portion sizes right, as this will all help us eat the right amount of calories to keep ourselves healthy. 
There is great crossover uh, between the work on food waste behavior change, e.g. Love Food Hate Waste has a big focus on getting the portion sizes right. And if the leftovers are then used in future delicious meals, making the best use of the food that you buy. And this could be a real opportunity for a focus going forward. And the third area is helping us all eat a more healthy, balanced, plant-forward diet, which is in line with the widely publicized Eat Well plate and indeed government guidance around the world. Given that the WHO estimates that around 2 billion people globally are overweight, there is an opportunity to help us all eat healthier by eating more fresh fruit and vegetables and pulses. And RAP has been doing work in London, London specifically in helping people adopt more healthy diets. And we're really struck by how this is resonating with Londoners and helping them change. So overall, Dana, I would say that if we tackle these three core areas, eliminating inedible food waste, getting our portion sizes right, and eating healthy, balanced diets, we can not only put ourselves on the pathway to net zero, we can also help people eat more healthily. And this is a win both for people and the planet. Very well said, Richard. Thank you so much. Um... You know, I, I think that point you made at the beginning about households, uh, both low and high income households being key drivers here. For a long time, we thought that it was only people who um, were in the high income category that were real food wasters. But the reality is it's across all income levels. And that that makes for a crossover with, um, you know, just the hunger issue, right? And food security. Mm -hmm. And if we can help people of low incomes waste less food, that can extend their food budgets and that can lead to better food security. So I think that's a really important aha that came mm -hmm. out of that UNEP report. Um, and also just the crossover with, again, that the health and the plant forward and food loss and waste, right? Portion control, portion sizes. Um, here in the US, we did an analysis of, of 42 different solutions to food loss and waste. And the number one solution, um, both from a greenhouse gas perspective and from a financial perspective was reducing portion sizes. Uh -huh. um, and that there's just huge opportunity. Of course, here in the US, we have huge portions, so there's even more opportunity, um, but to really address that. And, and I think, you know, a few of you, Lou Jane, Christina, Richard, you've all brought up, um, and, and Michael, I think as well, you've brought up this, this nice um, co-beneficial fact that healthier food is also um, lower GHG food, right? It has a lower greenhouse gas impact. Um, the lentil bolognese, Christina, that you mentioned, um, can both be healthier and reduce the greenhouse gases. So I think there's a real opportunity to kind of build on that as we look towards how we um, encourage people to adjust their behaviors, um, especially because people's own health is a huge driver in how they choose their food. Um, super, well, now we get to kick off a, a joint discussion here, which I'm really looking forward to. And I think we'll start with just that the question about challenges, right? Um, it's not easy to get people to change their food habits um, at all. And so what do you see as some of the key challenges, aside from just that global fact that it's difficult, um, what are some of the key challenges? And I think, Lou Jane, we'll start with, with you. Yeah, thanks, Tina. I will list five of the biggest challenges that I see. Um, first is lack of the systemic approach and um, political will. Um, if we take the food systems as a whole, it's the best opportunity for us to achieve net zero and the Paris Agreement goals as the, the most viable option to offset and become an efficient carbon sink. However, the power of food systems um, as a long-term effective and cost-efficient solutions is unfortunately yet to be taken seriously and acted upon by decision makers. Now, the UN Food System Summit last month was a good step and a good starting point in making some governments understand better and address food systems, but still more work ahead to integrate the food systems within the global policy agenda, including climate, biodiversity, and health. Second, lack of finance. We need to mobilize public and private finance to achieve net zero. 
For example, food systems on its own need around 300 to 350 billion US dollars per year. So we need new business models and investment opportunities with low transaction costs to scale climate and food systems finance. Third, lack of transparency and accountability to hold governments and businesses accountable and transparent and celebrating good business behavior. Um, fourth, disengaging people as consumers. We need to start engaging citizens, consumers, when designing policies and intervention and strengthen the role of consumers and consumer rights and policy making and standard setting, building greater independent understanding of consumer behavior and needs. And last but not least, lack of broad consensus of what to eat. So despite of a growing evidence of what we should and should not eat, there's still no shared consensus and lack of acceptance of existing science. We need to have a better science to policy interaction mm -hmm. and shared consensus around the best available evidence. Sorry about that. Great, thank you. Does anyone else want to chime in on challenges? Christina. I can. We have, I think each of us has been uh, speaking about behavior change in some shape and form. And of course, you know, there is this, this thing that behavior change at scale is not easy. And it doesn't happen overnight either. And I think what is really important is that, you know, for any behavior change to be successful, we need to align whatever it is we, we need citizens to, to achieve or to, to do differently, whether it's eating less meat or smaller portion sizes or waste, wasting less food. We need to align that with the needs and motivations people already have, which are more important and urgent for them than net zero, such as feeding their family every day with healthy and tasty meals or feeling smart and resourceful and save money in the process. Because only if we align you know, these two, then we have any chance for, for a lasting behavior change to happen. The minute people need to make a trade-off between you know, what's important and urgent for them today with you know, something you know, that's important for the planet in the future, you, we will not get there. And um, of course, greater understanding of environmental issues around the food system is helping. And we also see indeed, especially younger cohorts already, you know, knowing a lot more, understanding a lot more uh, so that, you know, uh, everybody can see, but also feel how they have personal agency and can be part of the solution. Yeah, and, yeah. and if I could just add to that, uh, Dana, yeah, just, I, I think the other thing is, is that these actions that we can take in a home make a real difference. You know, we add them all up and all these little changes we make in our home, getting our storage right, you know, eating our food, maybe, you know, eating more vegetarian uh, dishes during the week, plant forward dishes during the week, they all make a big difference. And the example, Christina, you gave in yours, the difference between, you know, one lasagna and another lasagna, one dish and another week, that makes a big difference. And if we can mobilize the world towards this, that's great, but it does need to be underpinned by data. And I think that one of the key things we're, we're lacking is insights into you know exactly what underpins our behaviors that we want that we'd like to change in order to deliver this net zero future so a clear focus on making sure we do totally understand and that builds to your point dana about food security um in 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 other countries you know really understanding exactly what is wasted and why for example exactly what's behind the data choices and that helps us really target exactly the messages to drive that change yeah i think well, that's uh, right Oh, go ahead, Michael. <laughs> I can just add, Dana, is from whose problem is it anyway? And I think there's this incredible challenge between the impact of my decisions today and my instant gratification and the long-term ramification of what we do or don't do as a collective group of individuals. And I think for many of us, it just doesn't feel that what I do today is really making an impact and therefore why bother? I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, that um, we also treat it as if it's one thing, right? People will change their behavior and then we're done. But I think one of the big challenges is this is a daily thing. And if I make, you know, lentil pasta one day, I still might make meat pasta the next day. And, you know, how do we how do we really and, and particularly food loss and waste, right? It's an ongoing 
journey that will never end. And so it, I think that's a challenge as well is really letting, have, helping people to shift their habits. And one, one secret is having them do it without them knowing, right? And that's where those behavioral nudges come in, the smaller plates that, that Michael mentioned. People don't even realize they're doing something um, differently necessarily. And, and yet when we change the environment around them or the way something is packaged, that can help sort of create that ongoing change without people even knowing it. Um, I also want to say that, you know, Richard, you mentioned like we need the data that underpins this. And I think on this panel, we have an amazing um, example of both RAP and Eat Lancet putting really um, just excellent research out there that can guide action. But it only works if people use it. And we have you know, both Google and Unilever as real corporate leaders that are open to taking that information and actually using it to changing their behavior. So I think it's it's so important to have the, that North Star guidance as well as the leadership from, from companies that manage so much of the food out there to really um, guide people in the right direction. So I love that we have that all on this panel here. Um, well, let's see, one more question um, and then we'll move to some audience questions as well. So please keep those coming in. Um, how do you think we can build momentum with citizens to maintain rapid progress um, to the net zero goal? You know, how do we kind of create a movement around this? Um, and Richard, I think I will start with you on that one. Oh, th thanks very much, Dana. I mean, I, I think the, the critical thing is that we can do it and there is real evidence of that change. So I was really struck by Michael's examples, Christina's examples of, of work with citizens has made a difference, but Michael working with, with Googlers and making a difference. And indeed actually the, the experience that the RAP has had in a number of countries that this change at scale can happen. You know, when we first started um, working on food loss and waste reduction, we thought if we could actually help reduce uh, food waste in the UK by a million tons, we'd be doing superbly well. Well, we've already got it up to 1.4 million tons already. And, and, and that's because of an awful lot of small things that people are doing every single day. And it's interesting, can we move back to the social norms that was in the human societies pretty much for the last couple of millennia? Because that's, in, in essence, that's what we always used to do. We always used to value food. Food was so important. Therefore, that was intrinsic to human societies wherever they were in the globe. So that, that combination of humans used to be really, really good at this, so surely we can do it again, and the fact that the interventions that we're already finding really work, using that, I think, can build momentum. This is doable, and we can do it even in the time available. Yeah, thanks. Christina, are you finding with your Make Taste um, Not Waste campaign that you're able to create some momentum around this? Um, what we are finding is that, of course, you know, um, creating inspiration educating people you know is of course creating a groundswell and indeed uh, inspiring some behavior but uh, of course deep-rooted behavior change work is needed uh, uh, also to really enable people to adopt lasting behavior change and you know what we are finding uh, in our work with consumers and of course it builds off you know of the tons of work that that, that richard and rap is doing and and uh, but also yourself Richard, etc uh, we, we actually have done quite a bit of uh, research also ourselves, including some of the you know, longest and largest uh, behavioral intervention studies, working with 1,000 families in Canada, trying out different interventions in the space of you know, how people can use the, the food they already have got in a better way. And we found that you know, uh, very simple changes, you know, like adopting a weekly use-up day, where people basically make a meal from the food they already got on hand, and maybe enabled by, you know, something we give them like flexible recipes, because Rich, as Richard said, people have lost a little bit the skill to put together the spread ingredients they have into, into something tasty. So giving that, them that very simple, you know, flexible recipes for the most wasted ingredients, that simple change alone can help people reduce food waste by up to one third, which is huge. So of course, now the question is, how do we, uh, uh, you know, deploy that at scale, keep nudging people? And, you know, we are putting our energy and, you know, on the scale of, of the brand I'm looking after behind that because we are very sort of committed to that. But, of course, we cannot do that alone and it takes a village, you know, to, to make that happen. So that's where, of course, the, the collaboration and the coalition of all 
I would say companies, but also NGOs, institutions who have a consumer interface comes into play. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lujane, go ahead. Yeah, then if I can just add, um, add, add to that. Um, what we did of, of it to actually um, truly shift consumption towards health and sustainable patterns is actually speaking about people's um, emotions, the food that matters with them. So we have launched a public engagement campaign where trying them to understand what will happen to their favorite food, especially for example, for coffee lovers, what's gonna happen with the coffee in the next decades, given the climate change impacts, same thing with chocolate, same thing with, with wine and so on. And it's quite important to, not just to connect with people's emotions, but also to their own culture, their own cuisine, the thing, the food that actually matters uh, matters with them so it's that as i said earlier in my previous remarks there's no one size that fits all but try to connect that with the with the people's cultures and the social context um, as well so we have launched a um uh, several recipes for healthy and sustainable food, but they're actually tailored depending on the region and the country that people can easily um, implement and apply it in their own kitchen and the food to be enjoyed together with family and friends. That's great. Yeah, making it personal, making it culturally relevant. Um, Michael, I'm going to go to you, but I'm going to give you a couple um, a couple things to address at the same time because we've had a couple uh, questions come in directed at you and and that is both how do we take what happens in the workplace and use that to motivate people to continue on this journey outside of the workplace and also another question that's come in asking to explain a little bit more about what you said that what you call a dish makes a difference so maybe you yeah. can address those along with your comments so maybe from how do you build momentum and i think you build momentum by starting something and ultimately giving it a try. And although it sounds always overwhelming, you only eat an elephant one bite at a time, but you have to start biting at the elephant. And I think that's what we're doing as well. We're an organization that is very focused on just launching and iterating. We're a software company by, by default. And that therefore it's really easy to write a number of lines of code, see what happens and then change. I think it's similar in our world, although it's overwhelming, little things can really make a difference. I think the second one is to really to think about the theories of change. I think there are different uh, methodologies for how you might drive change. It might be about messaging. It might be about ultimately food choice architecture. It might be about learning through experiences or it might be through systems change. And really to think through from what kind of change is needed and how do you apply the change in order to get it done. And now what you find over time, and specifically in our environment, is that you do influence people's taste palates. So if you really learn that you can have an amazing breakfast salad for breakfast, and if you have that three or four times a week, you ultimately are become so ingrained in that that over the weekends, you're gonna look for that breakfast salad at home as well. And that's there for over time, being exposed to just healthier alternatives. It just becomes part of who you are. And I think that's what we're seeing in our environment. The question about the dish title, it is how you describe something truly makes a difference. So if you describe something as this is going to be an overcooked, really kind of starchy kind of lentil bowl, sounds different than this is like the latest award-winning dish created by this famous chef and it is the hottest thing out there, people are probably gonna go for the second dish. And that therefore how you describe it truly makes a difference. That's great. Thank you, Michael. Um, we just have a couple minutes left here. So I'd like to, to let each of you sort of give a, a final comment. And maybe within that, um, if you could mention, you know, either just one thing that people can start by doing and or any resources that people should know about as they are going ahead and doing that. Um, and let's start with you, Lu Jing. Yeah, thanks, um, Dana. I think that the first thing that people can um, 
uh, start doing is that's just to choose the right um, food the next time they go to a grocery store and the next time they cook actually a meal um, to trying to reduce the uh, portion of the meal itself and ask to utilize every single um, every single aspect of the food that they buy to reduce also um, to reduce also food waste and to celebrate that together with family and um, and friends there's a lot of resources out there whether it's um, scientific reports scientific evidence um, as well as data available online however that can be sometimes how contradicting um, so choosing the best food that it's right for you and your health and the planet uh, would be the good approach Thanks, Christina. Yeah, I think we uh, we believe it's important to provide the inspiration, motivation, but above all, the simple, practical, and accessible solutions that help citizens to make those little changes in their daily lives. And again, the one thing I'm picking is, you know, to the use of day, you know, just you know, don't buy a meal for Thursday or whatever day is a use of day, but use up what's in your fridge already. There is a lot you can make out of that. And you know that alone can help reduce food waste by up to one third. Super, all right. Waste less Wednesday, everybody, as we like to call it. <laughs> um, Richard and then Michael. Oh, thanks, Daniel. I mean, I think the, just to echo Christina's point, the key thing is all of us making those small changes. That, yeah, that waste-free Wednesday, that makes a massive difference. Those small changes, big difference. And the simple thing from a food waste perspective is, yeah, buy what you need and eat what you buy. It's as simple as that. And just a simple tip from us, for me personally, one of the things I do is I always have a look in the fridge for breakfast in the morning and say, oh, what's actually getting close to use by date? Chuck it into a smoothie and make it and add some fruit juice and by gum, that's great. And of course it uses up some of those fantastic vegetables that maybe didn't get into the salad in the last couple of days. That it's, it's always a good way of using it up. Funny enough, it's always green. I don't understand that, but it's always green. <laughs> Michael, to you. Yeah, I would just say in addition to what has been said, let's celebrate all the amazing actually initiative and successes that we have. I think just give a hug to a food hero in your neighborhood and just anything that is happening, let's celebrate it. So we ultimately build positive momentum. And then your second question, Dana, from do you know a great resource? I cannot resist. I would say YouTube or Google. You were there for you when you have questions about food waste. Use us. Great point. I'm sure we've all Googled some food tip at some point. So thank you for that. Well, thank you so much to all of you, Christine, Lou Jane, Michael, Richard. It was a really thoughtful session. And um, of course, we weren't able to get to all the questions. So those we weren't able to get to in time will be answered over the next couple of days and put on the event website. Um, and the recording of the event will also be posted if you'd like to listen to the session again or catch up on some of the other sessions that you may have missed. Um, in about eight minutes at 5 p.m. BST, 6 p.m. CET, and 11 a.m. EST, the next session will explore how to create the right environment for a net zero food system and has an excellent lineup of speakers from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EIT Food, and DEFRA. Um, it will be moderated by Liz Goodwin from the World Resources Institute. And this same Zoom link that you're on now will work for that session, um, as well as the remainder of the sessions for the rest of the day. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, you'll see a holding slide in the meantime, so don't worry, it will still happen. Um, and I do hope that you enjoy the rest of your conference. And um, hey, it's Wednesday, so let's make it a waste-free Wednesday today. Thank you all. <laughs>